Welcome, everyone. Um, this is another Clear Mountain interview, and today we are very happy, uh, very pleased, blessed to uh, invite Ajahn Gavesiko uh, to come and, um, yeah, sit in, uh, offer his perspective on Dhamma, and uh, learn more about his practice and time as a bhikkhu. So I'll just thank you very much, Tanajan, for agreeing to uh, to be interviewed. So I'll just read your biography, and then we'll jump in. So Ajahn Gavesko was born in 1975 in the Czech Republic. He became interested in Asian religions and meditation around the age of 15. At the age of 18, he visited Amravati Buddhist Monastery in England for the first time. As time passed, he began to spend his summer holidays there every year and to become more and more familiar with the Thai forest tradition in the lineage of Ajahn Sumedho. While studying philosophy in Prague, he translated a number of Buddhist texts from Pali and English into Czech. In 1998, he became an Anagarika at Amaravati Monastery, then in 2000, a Samaner at Chethurst Monastery, and in 2001, he was ordained as a bhikkhu with Ajahn Sumedho as his preceptor. Ajahn Gavesiko spent several years in monasteries in the Ajahn Chah tradition in England, such as Chithurst and Amavati, and also in Thailand. After he lived in Western monasteries, uh, after that he lived in Western monasteries in Switzerland, Italy, Germany, New Zealand, and Norway. Ajahn Gavesiko is currently living at Sumeda Rama Monastery in Portugal. So that's just the overview, but uh, Don John, yes, thank you very much again. Um, so. Uh, perhaps we could uh, begin just with your upbringing um, in the, the Czech Republic and just curious if you would be willing to share some of your uh, early influences, what kind of brought you to Buddhism and gave you this, this leaning. Yes, so it's a particular personal background that always will have an influence uh, on oneself. So in my case, um, you have to imagine at, at that time when I was born, it was still <clears throat> during the communist regime and uh, the country was pretty much sealed off from the, uh, well, from much of the world, the Western world, certainly. So there was really a limited opportunity to have any sort of contact with Asia or Asian religions you know directly so there was the only thing that was available for me was finding some books so i remember finding some very old books in the local library um you know published way before the second world war um and i remember later <clears throat> getting into specifically you know buddhist texts i found a, a copy of the uh, probably the first German translation of the Majjhima Nikaya by Karl Eugen Neumann uh, in, the, in our local library in, in German. I could read German. And um, that was published in the 1895, I think. So that was the kind of access I had to <laughs> literature, even the, um, yeah, any kind of books basically uh, were not allowed to be published during the communist time. They generally disapproved of religion anyway. So, um, yeah, I became um, increasingly kind of attracted to the a Asian, um, anything to do with Asia, you know, China, Japan, and um, going through various different philosophies and, and then finally really becoming more and more interested in uh, what I could see was like the more original uh, teachings of the Buddha that came from India, of course, and the original texts that were in the Pali language. So that finally I uh, gained some access to some of those texts and in translation. And then it led me naturally to that kind of interest in, in even learning the original languages to, to have more direct understanding of it. Uh, thank you, Ajahn. I'm curious if, if you had any actual like teachers or was it mostly or entirely from books yes i had uh, very little in terms of direct teachers at that time um 1989 
1990, around that time, the sort of regime changed and there were some uh, people coming to visit from then on. So uh, occasionally one could meet people from abroad, but it was still fairly limited. And then the internet was just sort of starting in those days and it was a bit, a bit delayed compared to, uh, say, your part of the world. So when the internet later, like when I went to university, that's where really I, I gained access to the internet. And that was also the beginnings of, you know, when all the Buddhist texts were being put on the internet. And that really helped me a lot to gain access to um, just the whole world of Buddhism as it exists. And uh, in those days, I think a lot of people made use of these like internet discussion groups discussing, you know, Buddhism. Buddhism. So it was a really great discovery. I can remember feeling like that really uh, kind of opened opened up my, my world and I gained access, access to that. But there was one, one um, address I had that I, I wrote to, and that was um, Bhikkhu Bodhi in Sri Lanka. So I remember I sent him a letter, it must have been about 17, 16, 17, and um, started basically correspondence with him. He was very kind and actually exchanging some letters with me and giving advice and sending um, these wheel publications, you know, small booklets, and then uh, later some uh, larger books. And uh, he seemed very keen to help someone from this part of the world, which had very little access to Buddhist teachings, to Buddhist texts. And I was able to, you know, obtain uh, some of those texts. And I remember really treasuring these uh, you know, publications, which these days, when you find them in a library, they are kind of sort of old print, you know, um, in Sri Lan from Sri Lanka, not very good quality paper and kind of people don't read them anymore. But I remember I really sort of treasured these um, uh, Dhamma texts. And that's where I learned much of my of Dhamma from and the beginnings of also Pali terminology and all that. So, um, yeah, that was my um, early approach to, to Buddhist teachings. And so that's a pretty early age at, at 17. Um, you mentioned, you know, when you went into university, you began studying philosophy. And I'm just curious if you could talk about the difference of approach from the philosophy that you were learning versus, say, Buddhist philosophy or Buddhist practice. Uh, is there overlap or uh, do they not overlap? Are there, what are the limitations, what are the advantages uh, of having studied philosophy um, and maybe which particular philosophers you were studying at that time? Mm, so I was quite lucky in having some good teachers at uh, Prague University who were mostly, I mean, there was classical philosophy, of course, you know, the old Greeks and so on medieval philosophy, but then I, I was able to focus more specifically on uh, the kind of modern Western phenomenology. And there were some good teachers uh, who specialized in that and were able to really explain it well. So I, I focused on that um, particular school, which, you know, deals with the way, say, our experience um, of the world and of ourselves is constituted and how you know we can know things kind of directly in our experience mm. so that seemed to be quite a uh, valid approach and have some similarities with with the say the way the, the buddha talked about uh, the human experience uh, in the suttas so i found some of that you know helpful um, in those days uh, was a good good approach, but eventually, you know, gradually, the longer one I stayed at, in that academic environment and studying philosophy, I found more and more it was, um, you know, it was academic. Uh, it was something that one did as a kind of an intellectual exercise. Uh, you know, one had to write essays, and and um, it was a lot to do with with words, with um, you know, writing and discussing. Um, maybe refining one's understanding of particular terms. Um, but essentially, you know, something rather abstract. Um, 
it was um i mean it at least the phenomenology it pointed to like direct experience but at least the way it was uh, approached in the, the university it was all really based on like western philosophy you know there were all the terminology came from say classic or uh, Western philosophy, Greek and Latin terms. And it seemed to be really kind of removed, say, from my interest, which was more and more the more like the Indian Indian uh, thought world, the Indian religions. And I think that's a kind of bias that still maybe persists until today between like studying, say, Indology or anything to do with ancient India that's put in a different department, whereas philosophy is something that you study only using Western terms and Western terminology. And there's only few, say, scholars, Western scholars that bridge that, those two. So that more and more, I felt like mm, I didn't really need to learn that much about, you know, ancient Greek terms or study Latin and, and formal <clears throat> logic and things like that. And so uh, I turn more and more towards um, just uh, focusing on the on the Buddhist texts and actually starting to to learn Pali. And also, uh, just to say that you know, philosophy, Western philosophy, yeah, has that kind of limitation. I found even even these phenomenological thinkers, you know, they uh, didn't didn't really seem to apply, you know, whatever. The result was of the of the thinking, you know, it wasn't a kind of a lived teaching. It was still fairly academic. So I was looking for something that could actually be lived, you know, and applied in, in one's life. Tanajan, I'm curious. You talk about the the drawbacks of you know so many. It seems like so many words, basically. Um, but I'm curious what you think about this idea of writing as a form of thinking. Like, um, so, I mean, presumably, you know, going through that, that education and trying to express yourself on paper, um, if you see benefit in that, I mean, it's, it's a very different mode of, of learning than, um, we get in the, the Thai forest tradition that, um, yeah, you know, the Thai forest tradition is, is almost, you know, anti-academic in, in certain ways. Um, so I'm, do you think there's value in that and trying to express oneself on paper so as to test how well do I really know these things? Yes, that was that was one thing that I gained, I think, from being in that academic environment was to learn how to say refine one's understanding of a particular topic and then put it down in, in words and have it maybe commented on and challenged. So that was a, a good aspect of that and just learning how to work with um, with uh, texts, with books, being able to analyze a, a subject and discuss it uh, on, a, on a certain you know, level with the with one's peers. So all that is, I think, very, very helpful. And that that could actually be applied also to to our kind of uh, Buddhist to the area of Buddhism, studying Buddhism. So that was actually good. That was definitely a benefit. And that helped me later on, um, you know, just being able to express some, some thoughts and also just that analytical approach, you know, like when you read something, you read say different sources and uh, people approach a topic from various points of view, being able to uh, examine it and compare these different points of view and, uh, being able to extract the uh, essential uh, uh, points that they are making. So all of that, that's a really good, good training to have actually in the, in the kind of Western philosophical tradition. Yeah, thank you, Tanajan. And this is kind of a nice bridge over into Pali. You mentioned studying Pali and um, to start with, I mean, that can be just a very natural uh, transition. You know, you're, st you're learning another language, which is, you know, um, it's a cognitive you know, stretch. You have to move yourself in a certain direction. And I'm curious if you could speak a bit more about um, both learning Pali, how that influenced your, your practice in your life, and actually translating Dhamma. You mentioned, or in your biography, we mentioned um, uh, that you had actually done translating from both Pali and English into Czech. And I'm curious if, if that process either 
reading the text originally in Pali and or the process of converting that into your native language, um, how that influenced your metabolizing the concepts that were being gone over. Yes, that, that's a good topic. Um, I mean, I should also mention, uh, I forgot to say before, one big um, influence on me, of course, was um, like meeting Ajahn Sumedho because he um, I started going to Amaravati Monastery and then we invited him to teach in Prague one year, uh, 2016. <clears throat> and, uh, no, sorry, uh, 96. <laughs> and um, I remember discussing this topic with him, like how, how much do you need to study? How much do you need to learn? I was really into learning suttas, learning, learning Pali perhaps, really getting into that and uh, discussing this sort of uh, university academic approach with him. And he sort of turned to me and said, you know, how much longer do you want to study for? And I said, well, maybe another couple of years just so I can pass the exams and get my degree and then uh, after that, I I would be ready to uh, to become a monk, maybe. And and he just turned to me and said, well, "Don't you think it's a waste of time? Maybe you can come in and ordain at Amaravati <laughs> straight away if you wish." So um, that that also meant meant something to me because I had been feeling like that already, and just to have it sort of confirmed from him was uh, was nice. <laughs> because uh, he had done quite a bit of study himself and uh, he, he studied also and uh, when he was a young man and uh, and he could see how far it could take him um, but anyway coming to yes yeah, study another language that that is really really interesting because i learned other languages before I, I started early early on learning um, second language and a third language and and so on so I had some experience with that and how useful it is to know more, more than one language. It really enlarges sort of one's perspective on the world and one understands, say, that words and um, designations of things, of objects are not, you know, they are not sort of fixed and unique. You can, you can name a particular thing, give it a, a number of different names depending on which language you're using. And in, in one language, it's maybe not not really possible to uh, name something um, as well as in, in a different language. So it's something really useful. So for me, the really delving into the whole Pali language, which is a dead, it's a dead language. It's not something that you can actually speak with anybody, anybody sort of live. Um, yeah, it involved a lot of just working with. Uh, uh, translations. What I did was I took the available translations that I could get hold of, say, in, of a particular sutta passage. Uh, you know, there was one in English and there was one in German. I could I could have both or maybe two uh, alternative English translations, and then I would compare them myself, and then slowly uh, try to learn the grammar uh, from a textbook I got. Just. Um, enough grammar that was necessary to understand that particular passage so that I could uh, translate it. And I, uh, I had the uh, AK Warders, you know, a classic uh, Pali textbook, but that was quite difficult to, to, to use that because um, it, um, that approach of learning the whole grammatical structure, which is, you know, a classical uh, linguistic sort of approach to learning another language, it's, it was the same approach as, say, learning Latin or learning Greek, uh, but that didn't work so well for me. So I, I was lucky to find another book by Johansson, who was a Swedish psychologist that went to Sri Lanka, and he wrote uh, this book, um, Pali uh, for the Beginner, I think it's called Easy, uh, another different different way of, of learning Pali, basically. basically which just teaches you enough of the grammar to understand, say, a particular short passage from a sutta and explains just enough so you understand each word uh, in the sentence. And then uh, um, there's the translation. So you, you compose, you make the translation. And gradually, little by little, you get a feel for the language, the way the language works, just by 
translating in this way uh, short passages taken from suttas, uh, some of the gathas, the verses, and that that was definitely more my approach. So um, I didn't really have to learn all the you know quite complex you know tables and whatnot and grammatical structures in Pali, but rather I, I started reading more and more uh, just the suttas and um, translating them. Uh, I, I translated some shorter passages, uh, like a whole chapter of the Sanyutta Nikaya and then different number of suttas from the Majjhima Nikaya and other individual suttas that were then later published as books and and just working with the dictionary a lot and um, really getting a feel for the language, I was able to just read the suttas in, in Pali uh, after a, some amount of time. And, and of course, you won't understand every single word, but uh, you will you'll be able to follow like the whole flow of the sentence. And there's all these repetitions in, in Pali that you can you can follow and you understand how it works, how the language works. And actually, Pali is being an Indo-European language. It was not that different from the other languages like Czech and German that I've learned before, because it's an inflected language and the, the words change, there's certain principles that were actually not that hard for me to grasp. Um, so yeah, gradually I, I really uh, got into that whole, I would call it like the the thought world of Pali Buddhism. You know? So there's a whole, uh, you start to use, I, I thought of it, I imagined it almost like you you're kind of like swimming in this sea of, of Buddhism. So your your whole thought world is like um, imbued with all these sort of Buddhist ideas. And gradually, because I approached it and embraced it from such quite an early age, I was able to just, you know, think in a way that you'll be using these sort of Buddhist concepts and ideas in your in your own thinking. So I didn't, then later when I came, um, the monastery, came to live as a monk. I already uh, came from that kind of background, so it wasn't really difficult for me to adjust on that level. Whereas that that's what might be the problem for other people if if they haven't uh, internalized that whole kind of thought world of of the Buddhist teachings. Uh, there's a lot of maybe um, misunderstandings that are possible or uh, you know, just their own way of old ways of thinking, habitual ways of thinking that were picked up from the society, their education, all sorts of other cultural influences. It might not fit with the Buddhist teaching so well. So there might be a lot of this kind of dissonance. But in my case, it wasn't really uh, the problem.